So welcome everybody to this um, keynote session with Gayla Kilgore from um, uh, from Timaru. Gayla, I'll allow you to introduce yourself fully, but um, it's a real pleasure to have you here as part of our um, e-seminar series with the Rehabilitation Teaching and Research Unit at the University of Otago. So uh, with no further ado, Gayla, I'd love to hand over to you to um, introduce your topic and um, what's brought you to this work. Oh, thanks, Fee. Um, so my name's Gayla Light Fee said, and I am a physio. Um, I currently work one day a week as a locum in Ashburton uh, in a child development service, and I'm full-time doing my PhD. And I'm actually doing my PhD through um, this brilliant Catholic university in Australia. So um, I'm wondering if everybody can just introduce themselves so I know what sort of work they do. So I'm just, I'll name you, Nicola. Can you just tell me what you do and where you work? Oh, sorry. Just to interrupt for a second, Gayla, we've probably got too many people on. There's 50 participants, uh, 49 uh, 50. participants currently. I can only see four. That's fine. Oh, right. Um, that. It's fine. You, you might like to toggle your view in the top right-hand corner to okay. gallery view, and you'll be able to see oh, um, everyone okay. that's on. And um, also... Um, so um, there is uh, reaction buttons in the bottom right hand corner. So something that might be useful is to um, um, put your hand up using the reaction buttons at the bottom right hand corner. If, for example, um, you... if you're an adult, if you're an adult therapist, put your hands up. So I know how many are adults. Hi, Linda. Here. So the reaction I'm button good, down you. here. I'm how not are you a... today? I'm just trying. Yeah. I was going to try and log into that. Um that talk that's on at the moment, the um, physical activity versus participation with them, um, with Gayla. Yeah, that's just happening at the moment, but that's okay. I think it's on YouTube for a week I, afterwards, she said. So I think someone's on the phone when they're supposed yeah. to be muted. It's fine. Um, and uh, pediatric therapists. Perfect. And anybody that's on that is not a therapist, it might be a consumer or family member or anything. Takes a minute for the hands to go down automatically. Yeah. <laughs> Patience. Okay, perfect. So um, I will, obviously I'm a pediatric therapist, but I'll try to talk across the, um, the spectrum so that uh, everybody is covered. So Gayla, you're a, you're a pediatric physiotherapist um, and your, most of your career has been here in New Zealand. And um, I understand this work is not directly related, well, it's related to your PhD, but it's not your direct PhD content. Is that yeah, right? so, um, so my PhD is looking at participation and physical activity. So my PhD is looking at, I run a, um, a running program for three months in Christchurch with children with disabilities, children with cerebral palsy. And um, then I'm following them up, looking at the participation. So rather than focusing on uh, how uh, physically well they did, I'm focusing on uh, how it led to further participation or if it led to further participation. So um, the follow-up was supposed to be six months, but because of COVID, we've extended it to nine months. So I've actually, I finished in a month's time data collection. So I've got a year of weekly data collection of participation from families, which is pretty unbelievable. So, and I've just had amazing families. And as well, I've, I've got physical data as well. But um, yeah, so I've got eight months to write up after that. Now, how does this work? <laughs> Fantastic. And how does this work today relate to, um, to, that, to that larger study? Yeah, so um, I had to do a systematic review. And so the second part of this uh, presentation is the systematic review. Very good. Now, just before Gayla gets started, just a word. Um, this this is recorded. It is shared with students currently enrolled with the RTIU. So if you don't want your um, base on that recording, um, particularly outside of the interactive activities, then you might just like to turn your camera off while Gayla's presenting. The, over to you, Gayla. Cool. Okay, thank you. So I decided to call this uh, talk today physical activity versus participation. Where should rehabilitation focus? And I'm not going to give you the answers to that at the end. I just hope that uh, you will be thinking about whether you should be thinking about more physical activity in your practice or whether you should be thinking about more participation or whether you think you've got your balance right. And uh, also giving you reasons why you might look at those uh, both those parts in your um, 
So the systematic review, uh, like I just said, is titled Do Physical Activity Interventions Influence Participation with Children with Cerebral Palsy? And uh, it has been submitted, but not accepted yet. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, so like I said, I'm studying through Australia for my PhD. My supervisors are Professor Christine Imms, who's at the University of Melbourne, who, if you've read any participation information, she's um, a guru in that area. I also have Professor Susan Stott, who's an orthopaedic surgeon in Auckland and uh, lectures at the University of Auckland. Dr. Michael Spear is a biostatistician at ACU. Uh, Brooke Adair is, um, Dr. Brooke Adair is a physiotherapist at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and Amy Hogan is um, a researcher writer at the CP Society in New Zealand. So um, for those of you thinking about doing PhDs, five supervisors is a lot. So <laughs> most people don't have that, but it's been uh, good to have input from really um, diverse people. So the outcomes today, uh, the end of it, hopefully you'll all understand the importance of physical activity. And I am gonna focus on people with disability today. I'd also like to introduce this uh, new framework, which is the family of participation related constructs. And uh, I hope that'll make you uh, think about participation a little bit differently and also maybe include it with your um, goal setting if that's how you practice. Uh, I'd also like to look at the relationship between participation and physical activity. And then just briefly at the end, consider some outcome measures that are used uh, for uh, both physical activity and participation. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the ICF uh, classification of health and disability. So uh, when we look in the middle, when we look at activity, what we're talking about today is physical activity and we'll define what that is. And the ICF says that the activity then has bi-directional arrows. So activity can lead to participation or it can also, uh, participation can come back to activity. But also we know that if we're looking at body and structure, body function and structure level, that we also may be thinking if we work there on range of motion, strength, balance, reach, chewing, uh, those sorts of things that also may lead to improved activity. And so we'll discuss that uh, today. Uh, the other thing that's really important is that a lot of research that's been done at the moment, RCT research likes to pick every box. So for um, the adult with stroke, they may want to look at uh, body structure and function, they tick that off, then they look at activity, then they look at participation, and then they may have a measure for environmental and physical factors. And sometimes what that means is the research becomes quite diluted because people have chosen measures that tick boxes, but they actually didn't uh, look at them in a lot of detail. And so we find that particularly with um, participation, that, that the literature is not strong because people are focused at an activity level but the participation measure maybe wasn't specific enough. So firstly, just defining physical activity. The most f common physical activity definition is uh, one by Kasper and, Kasperson in, uh, two, uh, in 1985, and that's any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscle that requires energy expenditure. And the reason that's the most common um, definition is that often when people are thinking about physical activity, they're wanting to measure heart rate, uh, calories, um, they're wanting to measure um, energy output, such as with, was the exercise vigorous, was it moderate? Um, and nowadays that's done by uh, activity monitors, uh, things like everyday Fitbits, uh, sleep count monitors, uh, heart rate monitors, things like that. It's important to notice that, that with that definition, if you're holding your pen at the moment, that could be considered a physical activity. So to stand as a physical activity through to running a marathon. So we also can look at physical activity as in formal and informal activity. So formal activities tend to be those with rules, planned and goal-based. So they tend to be the sports we might participate in. They might be a gym fitness training program. They also may be informal, so unstructured, social, and unplanned. So it may be going for a walk with your family, maybe playing at the playground. Now, most of our research and most of our therapy is based on formal physical activity, but informal everyday activity may be just as important. For my research, the definition that I've been using is movement during sport, leisure, recreation, exercise, and play that involves physical effort. And the important thing about physical effort is obviously that has a lot of um, variables with it that may have the cognitive effort that you have to put in with it. It has the effort to get out of the house. So I'm not measuring um, heart rate. I'm not measuring uh, 
uh, effort uh, physically by accelerometry, anything like that, um, because my research is based on are we doing more, are we getting out and about, rather than um, what is our heart rate. Okay, so everybody needs a pen and paper. And what I want you to think about is a client you see, so it could be a child, it could be an adult, uh, it doesn't matter. And we're thinking about physical activity. So I, we won't share these, but this um, same theme will carry on through the talk. So I want you to think about a physical activity that you may be working on with a client. And I want you to write down two participation goals for that physical activity. Now, if you are not working in the area where physical activity is important, um, I would say it should be important for everybody, but if you're not, then maybe think about yourself and think about what might be two participation goals that you have for yourself regarding physical activity. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. And maybe give a thumbs up on the reactions when you've done. How's that looking, Fee? Personally, I just could do with another sort of 45 seconds or so. Oh, good. <laughs> That's fine. Perfect. I think by now, Gail, everyone's probably at the very least wrestling with the concepts with one, that, you've, at least that, one you've, goal. that you've thrown perfect. out for okay, the learning perfect. purposes. It's, it's the deathly silence at this end. <laughs> so I'm not sure if people are still listening or they've tuned out. It's all good. Okay, so even if you've got one, that's great. So we're going to carry these goals on um, and, and alter them if need be as we go. Okay, so I just want to uh, sort of encourage you to think about why physical activity is important. So the World Health Organization says that physical activity contributes to 3.3 million deaths globally per year. And a couple of days ago, I looked at the COVID information, which says that 809,000 people have died of COVID, which is not a year yet, but um, we're looking at three times more dying every year because of inactivity and the secondary consequences of that. So um, we've obviously really embraced the concept of looking after ourselves with COVID. Um, it would be interesting to see if physical activity um, could have the same um, re reaction and it obviously hasn't because this is a continuing program pro problem that's getting worse throughout life. Um, and uh, we, we, we're not tackling it well in society at the moment. So in 2018, uh, the World Health Organization uh, started a global action plan on physical activity because uh, you know, nobody's happy with this rate of um, mortality and, and the morbidity, morbidity that goes with the physical inactivity. And they created a more active people for a healthier world. And in that global action plan, there's actually a big section on disability about uh, providing more opportunities, looking at active transport, looking at more, um, more ways to help people be active. And so uh, it's really important that actually this is a, a global initiative that people should be um, buying into and that governments should be looking at as well. And so in New Zealand, the 
uh, strategy is being looked at by a Sport New Zealand and they've brought out a strategic plan um, that starts in 2020 and uh, it carries on for four years and then they will review it. And their strategic direction says everybody acts. And so they want to make sure that no one person is missing out on the benefits of this activity, regardless of gender, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation or, or where you live. So I think it's really nice to know that in New Zealand we have a plan and that's um, being looked at and that uh, it, it's inclusive of everybody. So just defining disability, disability in New Zealand is defined by Statistics New Zealand. So every time the census comes out, this is what we have to fill in and we have to check whether we think we have a disability. And a disability is defined as a self-perceived limitation. So anybody that thinks they may have a disability can tick that. But the definition is that it's a long-term condition or health problem, that it lasts longer or is expected to last longer than six months, and it's not completely eliminated within the system of life. So the domains that are defined as a disability are the seeing. So if you wear glasses or contacts and you still have a disability from that, that is considered a disability. Hearing, even when using a hearing aid. And then the next ones come under what we would maybe classify in our um, therapy as a physical disability, walking, lifting, bending, maybe a difficulty with upper limb skills, holding, grasping, using objects, maybe more under cognitive, learning, concentrating and remembering. And then perhaps under um, a speech would, and language would be communicating and mixing with others or socialising. Um, over half New Zealanders with a disability have more than one of these domains. And um, the invisible impairments, such as the uh, speaking and learning, occurs in 73% of our children with disabilities. So in uh, 2017, Sport New Zealand created an Active New Zealand survey, and some of you may have filled this in, some of you may have been sent it and not filled it in, and this is a snapshot shot of looking at what uh, people across New Zealand's uh, physical activity was during a week. Uh, so the survey sent out, it's online, and you fill it in, and you say, over the last week, this is what I did. They also look at what we call physical literacy, which is your understanding of exercise, your motivation to exercise. So in this survey, um, 6,004 uh, children, uh, young people, completed the survey, and of that, 711 had disability. And almost 7,000 adults with disability completed the survey out of 27,000 um, New Zealand adults. And it's the first time that people with disability and uh, non-disabled people have completed the same survey for um, Sport New Zealand. So it's a really important uh, document to look at what is happening for the future. So what did we find out? Well, out of the uh, New Zealand adults, that 24% of New Zealand adults say they're disabled and 95,000 New Zealand children, so tamariki and rangatahi, um, under the age of 15. And over half of the children have a disability that's existed since birth. Uh, at least 15% of disabled children come from uh, um, households that earn less than $30,000 um, $30, per year, so they're low socioeconomic families, and that we know socioeconomic status is very, very linked to disability. So um, low income, poor conditions, more likelihood of disability. Uh, we also know looking at the 53% that over half of disabled people have more, more than one type of impairment and we'll discuss the consequences of that. That uh, disabled tamariki and rangatahi are less likely to use sports facilities such as playgrounds. And on the left hand side, the biggest gap for disabled people was in comp confidence competence and the opportunities to take part in activities of their choice. And if we look at participation, that's really important. So looking at your confidence to participate, looking at your activity competence, are you feeling skilled enough to participate? And then looking at the opportunities, does the environment, does the context, does your family provide those opportunities? Okay, so what do we know about actually participation? So really importantly, up to the age of 25, children with disability are participating as much as children that are non-disabled. So the orange line is what they call disabled people. This is their language, not my language. And the red is non-disabled people. So we can see it's very closely linked. So that's the um, amount of weekly participating, the number of times 
that children participate and the number of activities. And then what we see after 25 is there's a decline in adults with disability participation compared to non-disabled adults. So the red stays relative st relatively stable to 75 years of age, whereas adults with disability, it decreases. And there's about a 16% decrease in adults with disability participation. So why is the type of impairment important? If you have one type of impairment, so the seeing, the hearing, the uh, bending, walking, uh, reaching, um, you're most likely to participate the same as your peers. However, if you have two or more dis uh, dis impairments, you're less likely to uh, participate. And so we see on this uh, infographic here, the um, orange is uh, rangatahi, so young people in New Zealand, and the um, orange is uh, adults. And we can see the percentage of participation um, based on impairment. So adults that have learning concentrating, actually they're only 63% might be active, whereas children 91%. So actually that's really good information and really important that those children actually are out there doing things. The areas we need to probably be concerned with are these areas down here where we have adults only in about 60% participation. So we see that young people are predominantly participating. It's sort of 85 to 90%, but adults it's that 60% level. Important to know that asterisks just indicate that there was very low numbers or very, very low numbers of um, young people in the survey. So remember there was only about 721 um, children and young people surveyed in total, compared to almost 7,000 adults with disability. So thinking about your clients here, thinking about the number of impairments they have, um, it may not be language that we like to think about, but that's the language that's used by Sport New Zealand, and that's how the survey language was also. Um, many of the clients that we see might tick every box here. And so if they have one, if they had two or more impairments, the likelihood of participating drops significantly. So I just want you to think about the implications for your client. So writing down again, what facilitators may help them be active? So what do you know is helping people get out there and be active? And what might the barriers be for your um, clients? And then we can discuss what the Sport New Zealand survey um, suggested. So just write down maybe two or three things under each of those. Kayla, I'm getting a couple of questions in the chat box around um, private messages around uh, just clarifying the definition of participation for those that might have popped in later we're that we're talking that. about here. We're coming to that. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, sorry, we're coming to that. So the ICF definition is involvement in life situations. Um, that's the ICF definition. And the activity definition is execution of a task. Great, that helps a lot. Thanks, Kayla. All right, cool. So we, we will get to that because I would like to expand on that definition. <laughs> um, so yeah, your, your goals hopefully will develop with the definition of participation. Okay, so all New Zealanders share the same motivation to participate in physical activities. So young people said they do it for friends, fun and family and fitness. So if you think about your own children, why are they out there participating? Is it because of you or is it because they're there with their mates and having fun? And all New Zealanders say that they would like, all New Zealand adults say they're doing it for well-being and fun also. 
Um, people with disability take part in sports and activities. People who take part um, with disabilities report higher health and well-being for, feeling, for feelings, eating, sleeping, so they feel better about those things. They report being happier with their weight, and they also report reduced screen time compared to non-participants. So facilitators may be things like family, they may be friends, they may be the environment, they may be the context in which the person's exercise is in. And so barriers for disabled people were reported as their own health and disability, lack of motivation, lack of energy, lack of time, limited equipment or community resources, and reduced financial support. And so some of you may have those things down. A recent, uh, article that I read from Spain said one of the main barriers for children participating was what other people think of them out there. So uh, that sort of self-concept about what do I look like and what, um, what are people thinking about me. So um, it's important to think about that the barriers may not just be physical, they may be uh, in mental health, psychological. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're just going to cover why promoting physical activity, and this is more at the body uh, function and structure level. And um, again, sometimes we need to think about what is the rationale for why we're encouraging physical activity. And um, although some of our practice may not be based at that level, um, we it's important we have reasons for what we're doing, and, and the reasons may be at that biomechanical or physiological level. So um, the infographics that I'm going to show you are from the UK Chief Medical Officer's Physical Activity Guidelines, big mouthful. So um, they came out in 2019 and they are really fantastic. They have great information. You'll see them as... Um, what are you doing today then? Just make sure you're on mute, please. Sorry. All good. <laughs> Um, so they have really lovely infographics, which I'll show as we go along here, and uh, they are easily downloadable and printable, and they could be posters that you might put up in your practice or um, where, you, where you see children or adults. So um, moderate and strong evidence means uh, this is looked at at a high scientific level. Um, so we know that physical activity for health is important in children and bone health, cognitive function, cardiovascular fitness, muscle fitness, weight status, and depression. And so lots and lots of great reasons for our children to be out being active. And then if you move on to adults, even more um, reasons to be active. So if you think about the wide range of uh, adults that we see, and that uh, you may be seeing somebody who has Parkinson's, but they also may have type 2 diabetes, hypertension, depression with that. And so there's lots of reasons for people to be active. And then in older adults, we also have falls, fragility, and physical functioning. And so again, even in the 75 plus, we know there's really good evidence for activity um, to promote physical activity. Okay, so thinking about, again, the client that you've chosen or your client group, if you think about those benefits of um, being active, what activity for your child, so first of all, we set a participation goal, what activity may you want that person to do? So what activity? Do you want them to do wheelchair boxing? Do you want them to do exercise? What activity? So just thinking about what your group of people that you're working with, what your client is, what activity may you promote? Physical activity. And what might be alternatives? Judy Winter, if you could mute yourself, please. Okay, so thinking about what activities you promote, maybe we need to know what activities are good at improving certain things. So this again is at the body structure and function level, um, but maybe we need to be thinking about that as well. Um, you'll notice that I started at participation and I didn't start at the activity level, and that's because um, we don't always need to start at activity level. And if we start at participation level, uh, it maybe changes how we are thinking about things. So if you think about the ICF, I'm working backwards. 
Okay, so this infographic looks at intensity of exercise. So it starts at sedentary exercise and moves across the top to vigorous exercise. And again, if you're thinking and you're thinking to clients, right, where, where do I want to start you working? Where do we want to start becoming active? Well, many of our clients are sedentary or maybe do light exercise, and we might be wanting to push them up the um, levels of um, intensity. Remembering how we uh, look at physical activity is often at um, the intensity. Um, we look at the type of activities, we look at the time, and we look at the frequency. So they're the, th the four things we often look at. So I really like this infographic and I think it's really good for um, children or people uh, that maybe uh, like visual cues. So down the bottom, we've got the heart and we can see the heart's at sedentary activity only beating a little bit and then it increases and increases until vigorous activity and then very vigorous activity. And then we also see the lungs. So you don't need to take very big breaths, but as we move up, you'll be breathing a lot harder. And then we look at this sort of scaling of how much energy you consume. So how hard is this? How hard is your heart working? How hard are your lungs working? And how much effort does it take? And so if you're thinking about um, trying to describe an activity to somebody or for them to let you know how well they're doing, um, how hard do you think you're working? This um, picture may work well. You know, people use the Borg scale or things like that, but I, I like this picture. Most of the research in physical activity is, like I said, looking at accelerometry and um, step counts and things like that. And they're trying to get people into this moderate and vigorous uh, activity levels. And we know so far with the uh, global mortality and the inactivity of the world population that this approach is not really working that well. And so there are people saying, well, actually, maybe we need to look at that left side at sedentary and actually just starting there and saying actually a little bit is better than nothing. And so I think that's um, for a lot of our clients may be a really important starting point rather than starting people at moderate or vigorous activity. Um, and you may have personal experience of that thinking, yep, New Year's resolution, need to go to the gym and you start off at moderate vigorous levels and you don't continue. Um, so we need to really think about that with our clients. The other thing that I would uh, really point out is a lot of the children or adults that we see have never worked, maybe moderately or vigorously before. So in uh, my research where I ran a running program uh, for children, um, some of them had never experienced breathlessness and they'd never experienced their heart beating really quickly. And so, for example, one of the boys said to me after we did some sprints, he said, my heart is beating outside of my chest. I can hardly breathe. And um, it sort of surprised me that he'd never experienced that. And for a lot of people, that's quite frightening. So if you're talking about a person who has lots of comorbidity health um, issues, um, that might be frightening. And same with the children that I was seeing, that actually was a new uh, phenomenon for them. So thinking about, when you're thinking about the activity that you chose for the person, and what intensity do you want to start at and, and what are you aiming for? Okay, the next you might want to think about based on the activity is, are you improving across the top muscle function? Are you trying to improve bone health? Or are you trying to improve balance? And you might be looking at all of those. So down the left hand side, we have the activity. And I just want you to think about the walking, which is um, almost near the bottom. So the stars, three stars are strong effect, two stars medium effect, one star low effect and an open star is no effect. And again, this is from the UK research. They've looked at uh, uh, high quality research evidence. So you can see walking, which may be a common um, activity that we start promoting, it improves muscle function a little bit, improves bone function a little bit, but it actually doesn't improve balance. And so we need to be thinking about, is that the best option for our person that we have chosen? Would that be the best activity? Now, at the top is running. I love running, if people know me. So I was a bit disappointed. Running only a little bit improves muscle function. It's good for bone health. Doesn't really improve balance as much as I thought it would. So we're looking at activities maybe by intensity. We may also be looking at what helps with muscle function, bone health, and balance. And then the client that you've chosen for today, you're looking at are some of these things that I was looking at for activities are they good options and how can I improve um, maybe muscle function a bit more than I thought? Okay. This, I just um, added this uh, infographic in because I really like the thoughts of this for our clients. So on the left is strength and balance and on the bottom is the timeline for age. 
And so the green is hopefully you and I, that we've had successful aging and we've got good health and our strength and balance is as you would expect. So peaks during our um, teen years through to our working years and decreases later in life. Now, if you haven't been active, then we see this blue curve. So the blue curves goes round and you're a bit lower than um, somebody who has been active. Now, what about our children who are born with a disability and don't move or um, develop strength and balance the same way? Where is their curve? And if you're an adult therapist and you end up uh, treating children that are then become adults with disability, where is their curve? And we know that strength and balance are important for life, um, but where would their curve be? The other thing I want you to think about is somebody that maybe has had a, um, a, a neurological insult um, at some stage in their life, if they're tracking along the green line and then they um, have this insult where they have physical impairments where they're not able to um, do what they used to, where does that line go? Does it sharply decrease downwards or actually are we in a better place than somebody who has been inactive. So if somebody's been active all their life and then uh, in their 70s they have um, say a stroke, where would that curve go for them? And um, I think uh, being active for life um, allows that curve to be in a better place if that happens. Gayla, most of your um, infographics have got a reference on them. Many of them are from Sport New Zealand. I'm getting some inquiries about this one in particular. There's, did you create this one or is this available externally? No, so this is all the UK um, and, and the UK uh, uh, Chief Medical Officers uh, report. Yeah. So you can find it on their website. Sorry, yeah, it's, it, I haven't referenced this page, but it's on the others. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so let's look at how active we should be. So uh, again, the, um, there's lovely infographics for each of these age groups. So just briefly think about what do you think would be how much activity a zero to five year old should do, our teens, our adults, our older adults, and then people with disability. And are there guidelines for these different age groups? So just have a quick, maybe think about what you think it should look like. And are you thinking mild, moderate, vigorous exercise, Gayla? I'm, I'm thinking general. I'm, I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking general guidelines. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it doesn't matter who we're working with. Um, yeah, we need to be thinking about what, what, what should, which is our role to be encouraging this. Okay, so again, these infographics are um, from the UK site um, and they are each page is referenced. I'm sorry that the last page was referenced. So uh, this is a lovely um, poster again that can be downloaded. Um, so this is for zero to birth. And so their um, motto is such as active children are healthy, happy, school ready and sleep better. And along the top, they have um, what the research suggests. So people can say, um, sorry, what the research shows. So this is from their um, reviews to produce this document um, that, uh, you know, you've got developing bone, uh, bones and muscles, encourages movement, helps brain development, improves sleep, improves social skills. And so for this age group, we're suggesting that at least three hours or so 180 minutes her day should be active for these children. And I really like the fact that in this um, infographic also, they've said actually the research suggests that children under one should be prone for at least 30 minutes across the day. And the reason uh, for those that aren't peds therapists, that um, why would they need that? Well, with uh, technology and equipment, a lot of babies are spending a lot of time um, in buggies and capsules um, sitting upright rather than floor play now. So thinking about children that you know that are under five, um, three hours per day, thinking is that realistic and how would that look for our um, children that uh, don't move as well for themselves um, and that may need assistance or may need equipment or things like that. How can we get them to that level of 180 minutes per day? So the motto along the bottom is get strong, move more and break up inactivity. And even at this early age, we're talking about in inactivity for children. The thing that I think is quite funny with this infographic is that one of the infographics is skipping and I don't know too many five-year-olds that skip that well with a skip rope and not um, 
first to first to five year old. So apart from that, I love the infographic, but I'm not sure about the scan. Screen time is kind of the the elephant in that slide, isn't it, Gayla? Yes. Yeah. 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 So are these uh, the guidelines from Canada. And if you look on the New Zealand um, Ministry of Health website, you'll also see these guidelines. So um, at the moment, the guidelines for New Zealand children are that they should be active for at least 60 minutes each day in moderate to vigorous activity. So if you think about our little diagram with the heart and the lungs, that's the heart beating lots and the lungs beating lots and children huffing and puffing. They should also do bone strengthening exercises three times a week, and that would be you're climbing, you're throwing balls. It doesn't mean going to the gym and lifting weights. Reduce sedentary time, have adequate sleep and nutrition, and minimise screen time to two hours per day. And um, that's a really big uh, focus in lots of the health guidelines. And if you see the four across here, you see sleep and nutrition is the biggest, but sleeping and sweating, so that's the moderate vigorous activity, is the next biggest and the sitting is the lowest. Now the guidelines came out in 2016, but the uh, UK group has actually modified these. So they are saying aim to be active at least 60 minutes per day across the week. So for some children they need rest days and on those days they may be less active, but on other days you may do more. And I think that's really important to know that sometimes children are just too tired to carry on doing things, particularly maybe our children with disabilities, they do need rest days. But then it's about trying to increase those um, minutes across the week. Again, at the top, they've got the reasons to be active. And again, that's from um, high level um, systematic review that they conducted. And then it's got ideas of activities and suggesting that they're across the week. And then at the bottom, they've got this inactivity, this arrow, let's decrease screen time. So find ways to help all children and young, uh, young people accumulate an average of at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day across the week. So that's different than 60 minutes per day. Okay, so they've, um, the UK group has included adults and older adults together. And along the top again, they've got in purple why you should be exercising, why you should be active. They've also got some really nice little um, boxes saying some is good, more is better. Make a start today, it's never too late, and every minute counts. And um, the American guidelines that came out the year before the UK guidelines, um, there was some research, and this is not my area of expertise, but there was some research in adults that showed even 10 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise it's gains for the next 24 to 48 hours. So things like your blood pressure is lowered, your cholesterol is lowered, you sleep better. So what we're trying to say is that actually, get out there, do something is better than nothing because you can make change straight away. So the guidelines for actives are at least 150 minutes of moderate activity per week or 75 minutes of vigorous activities. So the vigorous is the running, the sport, the climbing stairs. And the moderate may be swimming, biking, cycling, walking. Um, again, it depends on how you do these things. If you're a cyclist, then obviously that's more vigorous. This is again different than what's on the New Zealand Ministry of Health website, which suggests for adults it's 30 minutes a day, so 60 minutes a day for children and 30 minutes a day. I like the type of um, thoughts that you spread your exercise throughout the week because Obviously, um, some uh, exercise uh, recommendations are that you do have rest days, particularly if you're training at a higher level. Um, and also this maybe is more doable for people. But again, rather than moderate to vigorous, we may be thinking of just actually being out there doing things. And again, um, this has the minimize the screen time and it has some ideas of how to improve balance. Okay, so what about disability? I know this is a really busy slide, but I, I think this wording from the UK group is really important. So there is a growing evidence on volume, duration, frequency, and type of physical activity. So that's all the infographics. The evidence for people with disabilities is very low. So we have mainly spinal cord injury and mainly intellectual impairment. And there is very limited information on those with sensory impairment. However, there is no reason to vary the guidelines according to impairment time. So the New Zealand statistics had the six impairment times. The guidelines that I've just shown you are suggested for adults to remain the same. 
There is no evidence to suggest that appropriate exercise physical activity is a risk for disabled adults and the health benefits are not the same. So any myths about physical activity being inherently harmful for disabled people should be dispelled. And this is actually the first group that's come out with that. The uh, Canadian guidelines say consult your medical professional. The American guidelines say consult your medical professional. And so as um, therapists, we may be that person uh, that our clients come to. And so I think uh, this group has reviewed the literature and said actually the adverse effects from exercise are not as great as the adverse effects from being inactive. So I think that gives us good rationale for going ahead and trying to promote physical activity in our um, clients. They also have a lovely infographic for disabled um, adults. So at the top, make it a daily habit. And then they go through and talk about the benefits for people. So for substantial health gains, aim for at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. And so when you think about what you wrote down for your client, how would you get to this level? Is that realistic? Where would you start? Is your person already there and do you need to add vigorous activity in? And what areas of physical activity are you going to be looking at? Are you looking at improving strength? Are you looking at improving cardiovascular fitness balance? Or are you looking at all of those? And then what activities will you choose? So those of you who work with children will be thinking, well, what about children? Okay, so no guidelines exist for children. So what is realistic? So Vishirin uh, wrote a report in 2016 and said, we should strive to achieve the same guidelines that are expected of children that are non-disabled. We should increase the dose from individual baseline to individual goals. And we should shift the focus from therapy to community-based programs. So if we're wanting inclusive um, physical activity and we're wanting children to be involved, when they're telling us the things that facilitate involvement are fun, friends, uh, being with family, perhaps that should be community-based. And then in a commentary about Vashiran's article, Wyatt wrote, should participation be the focus? And um, so we'll slowly move on to participation now. So uh, my research is about cerebral palsy, but I think this, um, and the reason it's about cerebral palsy is that most of the childhood literature is about cerebral palsy. So there is no other groups that have been researched as well or as, um, and there's much detail. And so therefore um, this becomes the focus of the um, rest of the presentation. So children with cerebral palsy who have the highest motor capacity are most active. However, they still participate less than their peers. Their physical activity reduces with age. Families are important in keeping them active. So what we know is if you're in an active family, children are more likely to be active. Um, and that's in um, disabled and non-disabled populations. And that children really enjoy being active, but there's many barriers. So for those that you are not aware, CP is a um, permanent disorder of movement and posture, and it coexists with many other disorders and impairment. And so we know that children and adults with cerebral palsy have reduced cardiovascular fitness strength and habitual physical activity. They also are at increased risk of metabolic and cardiovascular disease, and they have an increased incident of other chronic diseases. So asthma, arthritis, stroke, and joint pain. So if we're thinking about the big health picture of impairments, often CP have two or more um, impairments, and so therefore they um, have an increased risk of being inactive. Just a uh, time check, Gayla, just 10 minutes. Ah. Okay, okay, I'll move on quickly. Okay, so let's move on to participation. So the ICF says that participation and when they are code participation and activity, uh, what they do is they code them together. And um, there are some issues with this for people that are participation researchers. So they use capacity, which is the execution of the task at the highest level. So this is when they come to GateLab and they look at your gate results or when you're testing them using a um, specific uh, test in your um, therapy room. Um, however, we know performance is different. So how children walk at home, how children um, play at home, how adults walk in the community, for example. So the critique exists that when you use these qualifiers, activity and participation are joined together. And when you did your goals at the start um, and you looked at participation, your participation goal should not be the same as your goal. 
Um, there is also no universal, uh, sorry, the other thing is that um, when we look at the capacity and performance, it looks at activity competence and participation is not activity comp competence and we'll look at that. There is also no universal definition of participation and we also don't know what pathways should promote or do promote increased participation. Okay, so looking at the ICF, we looked at those bi-directional arrows. So programs, physical activity programs that look at body structure and function only show low to moderate evidence of improving physical activity. So if you focus on strength, range of motion, there's only low evidence that will improve your physical activity. And programs that focus on participation show very limited evidence that physical activity will improve. So we assume looking at those arrows that we will be able to move between activity and participation, but actually there's very limited evidence for that. And that includes physical activity programs that include motivational interviewing, goal setting, lifestyle input and mentoring. And so those that are focused on participation are wanting to focus on physical activity that is increased through life and throughout the lifespan. Okay, so participation, when people are asking the definition of participation, the definition of participation that um, we use is uh, a child or adolescence or an adult's attendance and involvement in physical activities in any environment. And so attendance is defined as being there and involvement is defined as the experience of participating while attending. And I'll talk to that now with this model. So this model is called the family of participation related constructs. And there's two parts to it, a person part and a environment part. So I'll just explain this. So the, uh, the picture on the side is a person and a person obviously exists within their environment and their context. And for a person to participate, they need to firstly attend. So attendance is about being there. So for example, you're all attending this talk. The question is, are you involved? So if you are on your phone at the same time, if you are writing your shopping list at the same time, are you involved when you're attending? So attendance and involvement are not the same. You have to attend first to participate before you're involved. And then when we look at the person factors that actually influence participation, we know preferences influence. So a person choosing to be active and choosing their choice of activity will participate more. So, for example, if you made me do um, downhill skiing uh, today on a freezing day, I might not want to participate there because it's not my preference. We know that a sense of self will also influence participation if you feel good about doing things, if you're engaged. And activity competence. So remember we said that on the ICF model, activity and participation are joined together. Activity competence is a factor that feeds into participation, but it's not participation. And you see these arrows. So this is a multi-directional uh, model. The other thing about this model that's really important is that you can start your goal setting and you can start your interventions with families at the participation level. So you may set goals that are attendance goals or you may set goals that are involvement goals. I'll briefly go through this. So the environment also affects the context and how somebody participates. So somebody may not attend if the weather is bad. They may not attend if it's a Friday because they've got something else on. Their involvement will change because of the environment also. So things we think about with attendance are how often, the frequency, how many, and how long the activity goes for. And with involvement, which is a new concept for lots of people, it's about how you're feeling how much you're thinking about it and how much effort you're putting into that um, physical activity. So involvement is very personal and nobody else should judge that. So just because you're seeing a soccer match and uh, some children are racing after the ball and another child might be picking daisies on the side of the field, that child's still attending, but are they involved in the game? A child that's watching the ball may still be very involved with the game, even though they're not chasing after it with an adult doing an activity. So if we're looking at involvement, it should be rated by the person if possible. So uh, we might just finish with this. So I want you to go back to your um, goal that you did. And I want you to think about, is it an attendance goal? So I'll put up the um, last slide. Or is it an involvement goal? And if it's not, if it doesn't fit under this sort of definition of participation, can you change it to be that? So I'll put up what attendance is. So most of you will have had an attendance goal that maybe suggests 
doing something, going to something. Um, but you may not have thought about an involvement goal. So that's about how you're feeling about the activity, how much you're thinking about it, or how much effort. It's not measuring heart rate, it's not measuring respiratory rate, it's not measuring sleep count. It's about your personal thoughts about how, you, how involved you are. So I'll give you an example and then you can um, do the activity. So an attendance goal might be I want to go to jump jam. So by the end of term three, I want to go to jump jam three times a week. It's not saying the activity part about the execution of jump jam. It's just saying I want to go to jump jam. So a minus two using a gas scale might be once a week. Your zero where you want to achieve maybe three times a week. And the ultimate may be every day, actually, all the rest of the class goes five times a week. That's where I want to go. So that may be your attendance goal. That's about the frequency of attending. You also may look at duration. So by the end of term four, I want to go to jump jam for five minutes. At the moment I get there and I leave, or at the moment I get there and I'm there for five minutes. So you might want to increase that. So attendance, remember, is the frequency, the duration, and the diversity. And I'll give you an example of an involvement goal. So most measures for involvement are about enjoyment, okay? So, um, but that's not just the only thing about involvement. So I want to enjoy jump jam. So by the end of term three, I want to enjoy going to jump jam. At the moment, I don't enjoy it. That's why I'm only there five minutes and I only go once a week. I like it a little bit. I like it half the time. I like it most of the time. I like it all of the time. Now, if you're thinking about somebody doing an activity, we can't tell whether they're enjoying it. it they may have a smile on their face, but it might not be that they're enjoying it. They may not be smiling, um, but it may be that they're really involved. They're having to focus, and that's why they're not smiling. So, for example, an involvement goal may be, I want to focus on jump jumping. I don't focus at jump jumping. I focus a little bit. I focus half the time. Through to, I focus all of the time. Okay, so that might give you some ideas about wording to use. So if you go back to the questions, so look at your participation goal that you had for the person, your client, and think about is it attendance or is it involvement or it, was it actually an activity competence goal? And can you write it to be an attendance goal? And can you then also look at that activity and write it as an involvement goal? So I'll use those words there to help. Now, Gayla, we're just at time here, and um, I don't know that many people will have planned for the hour um, yeah. available to come to today's talk. Now, I am aware that you have a few public speaking events coming up, Gayla, um, <laughs> uh, uh, related to this sort of wider body of work, and one of them is a series of lunch and learns with the Paediatric Society of New Zealand that I'm yeah. in involved in. So those will be advertised through the same social media circuits that you received information about this talk. Um, and Gayla, are there any other talks or modes of dissemination that you're using that people could tune into to, to learn more about your, your, your fantastic work you've been doing here? Um, so um, the, there's a group called CP Achieve, which is an Australian group that's presenting. If you look at the um, website, it's actually um, a group that has five years of funding uh, looking at participation and um, well-being in um, adults with cerebral palsy. And they're doing a lecture series as well throughout um, throughout the rest of the year. And it looks at uh, things like transition. Uh, it looks at um, students like me presenting their works um, so yeah, there's really that will be really interesting to people. Um, I presume that's Zoom based. And have you got the link yeah. website for that or a link? Uh, so if you just look up it? CP Achieve, um, you'll find you'll find that um, it's it's a big uh, group in Australia. Again, um, particularly if you're interested in adult research, that's a um, that's their focus. But we'll have information about. Obviously, I'm presenting and I'm presenting on people. If you've got a final slide you'd like to flick to with any kind of um, links, logos or anything on it, Gayla, now would be the time. Um, okay. But um, I would, as a um, colleague here in New Zealand, um, I'd just like to thank you so much for taking the time out today. I know you have got more than um, a day's worth of things to do every day. And um, um, I love the way that your research is, is absolutely at the cutting edge of uh, driving our understanding and our really embedding these concepts of um, 
um, um, you know, greater client choice and voice and um, participation um, in the disability community and the bridge you make, you've made with uh, Australia, um, continue to foster those relationships with our um, fantastic colleagues over in Australia as well. So thanks very much. You can use the emoticons if you like to um, uh, thank Gayla in the usual way. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for tuning in today, everybody. Ka kite anō from the RTIU. Thank you so much, everybody. And I've just put the references if anybody wants the references uh, for the for where you can get the um, some of the pictures. And yeah, sorry that I went didn't cover everything today. No, great job and um, so much so much um, knowledge there, Gayla. Um, if you're not already on the RTRU Facebook page, that's where we disseminate, one of the primary ways we disseminate information about our keynote speakers and public lectures. So um, check in to that one. And I'm Both really now. happy anybody emailing me if they've got questions about their goals or um, questions about the talk as well, it's not a problem at all. And that's gala.kilgore at acu.edu.au. Good one.